August 24th, 1944. A massive B-17 bomber stream pierces the skies of Germany. The tide is turning against the Nazis. The Allies strike targets throughout the country with near impunity. Their main target was a complex in the Merseburg area, which involved the armament factory and some chemical plant. The Allied bombers are each packed with a heavy payload. B-51 Mustangs, the most advanced Allied fighter in Europe, provide top cover, ready to take on any fighters that rise to challenge the heavies. But 30,000 feet below, a lethal new threat is lying in wait. Luftwaffe pilot Siegfried Schubert prepares for the most dangerous mission of his life. He is one of the men of JG-400, tasked to fly an experimental interceptor into combat, the rocket-powered ME-163. From Schubert's perspective, he saw an American aerial armada of about 450 B-17s escorted by 120 or more fighters headed towards Merseburg. The, the, the bombers were inbound to the target. Command sounds the alarm. Torpedo, the code word for launch. Schubert's rocket engine ignites. 3,700 pounds of thrust crushes him back in his seat. The comet rapidly reaches 200 miles per hour on the runway. Schubert eases the stick back slightly. The rocket plane lifts into the air. At 200 feet, Schubert ejects his landing gear. A small propeller in the nose generates electric power for the aircraft. Schubert accelerates past 400 miles per hour. When that speed was reached, the pilot honked back on the stick into a dramatic 60 or even 70 degree climb. And with the tremendous amount of thrust that that uh, rocket engine provided, uh, from takeoff to 40,000 feet could be as little as three or three and a half minutes, and nothing on Earth came close to that. Schubert launches into the stratosphere. In just three minutes, his comet is perched nearly 10,000 feet above the incoming bomber stream. The 163s positioned themselves uh, overhead so that they could make a high-speed diving pass, which was their preferred method. Schubert will use a standard comet tactic. He'll climb above the bomber stream, then dive through it, making an attack run. After this first high-speed pass, he'll zoom climb again, bank around, and make a second pass. By this time, the ME-163's fuel will run dry, and he will be forced to return to base. Schubert noses over and dives on the B-17s, accelerating past 500 miles per hour. At nearly three times his enemy's speed, he closes rapidly. The German selects a target. No one inside the bomber is aware that they are being stalked from above. The Comet pilot opens fire. High explosive shells burst inside the B-17's left wing. Schubert zooms past, too fast for any Allied gunner to track him. His victim lurches, dropping out of formation. Now, at that time, Schubert wasn't able to try to keep score. He just knew that he had scored hits. In point of fact, that airplane never returned to base. The comet climbs, circling for another attack. Within seconds, Schubert has a new target in sight. He pitches over. Schubert's heavy cannon pummels another flying fortress. The B-17 
B-17's right outboard engine bursts into flame. That airplane went into an uncontrolled spiral and blew up in midair. So there was no doubt that that was a confirmed kill. After a mere eight minutes of powered flight, Schubert's rocket engine flames out. The German breaks off, having scored two victories in a single sortie, a record for a Comet pilot. Schubert glides back to base, scanning cautiously for Allied fighters. The ME-163 touches down on its belly, a bumpy ride, but one that the tough airframe is designed to take. The mission was brief, but it wreaked great havoc. For stunned American bomber crews, the top secret ME-163 is a terrifying new threat. The design that became the rocket-powered ME-163 started as a glider in the 1930s. The ME-163, stubby little thing with a lot of wing for an airplane that small. And that was really the reason that the 163 was developed in the first place, to test that wing and airframe configuration. But at some point around 1941, some German engineers got the bright idea, suppose we put a rocket engine in this machine and see what that does. The top secret design was meant to supply the Luftwaffe with a cheap, short-range interceptor that could unleash lightning-quick attacks on Allied bombers. An interceptor is a short-range, direct contact weapon with a pilot, and their only mission in life is to take off, engage enemy aircraft, and get back down to the ground. A Valter rocket motor was selected for testing. The engine was a technological marvel. Reaction chemicals were first mixed in a steam generator, which powered the primary fuel pump. This pump drew more reactants from the fuel tanks, carrying them to the combustion chamber, where they were mixed and ignited to produce thrust. The engine's main drawback was the extreme volatility of the fuels. What it was, you had the T-stop and the C-stop configuration. Uh, T-stop was nothing more than a high concentration of hydrogen peroxide. C-stop was a combination of methyl alcohol and hydrazine hydrate and water. Separately, in two separate containers, there were harmless compounds. But if you throw those things together pretty quickly, you have an explosion. So the technology issues they faced was, how do you control the explosion with piping in these fuels to get a controlled explosion to create rocket power without killing the pilot and blowing up the aircraft. The first ME-163 Comet prototypes were tested in 1941 at Penamunda. In October of that year, German pilot Heine Dittmar nearly broke the sound barrier, flying his Comet up to 623 miles per hour. They knew after testing by 42 that they would have a very fast interceptor which would reach altitudes of 15,000 feet per minute. In two minutes it was at operational altitude. But there was a catch. The fuel burned up in only eight minutes. And once expended, the rocket plane turned back into a glider. A sitting duck for enemy fighters. The definitive version of the Comet, the ME-163B, was combat ready by mid-1944. The aircraft was tiny in comparison to other fighters in the air, basically consisting of wings and an engine. It was merely 18 feet in length, roughly half that of a P-51. Both wing routes housed extremely heavy armament, 30 millimeter Rhein-Borsig Mark 108 cannons. A few well-placed shells could knock out a heavy bomber.
On March 16, 1945, pilot Rolf Glogner will take to the skies in this incredible machine. While attacking a formation of B-17s, He'll find out his ME-163 isn't just fast, it can dogfight as well. In a thrilling head-to-head -head matchup with a British Mosquito, Glogner will pit his Comet in a struggle of life and death. March 16, 1945. JG-400 pilot Rolf Glogner straps into the cockpit of an ME-163 Comet. I was on call, and then on sitting call, where you were inside the cockpit in case things had to happen quickly. The fuel on board is so unstable that Glogner must wear a protective suit. We had for sharp starts had the asbestos combination. We wore asbestos suits and long gloves in case the fuel spilled in an accident. We were completely covered. If the fuel came into contact with your skin, it burned. And normal cloth would have burned immediately. It was dangerous. The corrosive fuel is but one of the many dangers facing the Comet pilot. If he didn't blow up, if he didn't get shot down, and if he didn't die and explode on impact landing, then he had to look forward to doing it all over again. Suddenly, the German flak gunners cease fire. The alarm is sounded. Allied bombers are passing overhead. It's up to the Comets to try to stop them. Glogner lifts off, ejects his landing dolly, accelerates to over 400 miles per hour. Then pulls into a steep 70 degree climb. From start, yeah? From takeoff, it took two minutes to reach combat altitude. 30,000 feet. A standard fighter like the ME-109 would have taken 30 minutes to do that, and the enemy plane would have been long gone by that time. Above the bomber stream, the navigator of a twin-engine RAF Mosquito spots a telltale vapor trail heading his way. Allied pilots have come to dread such a sight. Glogner flies up through the B-17 stream without scoring any hits on the bombers. His focus quickly narrows to the Mosquito passing overhead. On this day, Glogner will see how his ME-163 stacks up in a dogfight. The Mosquito's lightweight wooden frame was powered by twin Rolls-Royce Merlin engines. The aircraft was known for its speed and its hard-hitting combination of 20-millimeter cannon and 30-caliber machine guns. The ME-163 is far faster than the Mosquito and surprisingly maneuverable in a turning fight. But the Mosquito has much better armament and can absorb more punishment. Glogner is here. The Mosquito is here. The Mosquito pilot will turn in to Glogner, hoping to get a shot while the Comet is still in the climb. The Mosquito breaks hard. Glogner eases the stick forward. When I was underneath him, he dropped his wing tanks and he almost hit me. But they passed right by the tips of my wings. That would have been terrible. I got lucky. Glogner banks left to get onto his enemy's six o'clock. So 
as he banks and rolls himself, he sees the mosquito pilot trying to turn pike to get him. The engagement has turned into a classic circling fight. Both pilots turn as tight as their planes allow. But I had the ME-163 and it was so agile. So that's how I was able to shoot him. I shot the right engine and then it went down and disappeared. I didn't follow him because to me, he was finished. Just then, Glogner's fuel runs dry. He won't get the chance to attack any bombers. And with more Allied fighters in the air, survival becomes top priority. Glogner glides back to base. All Luftwaffe pilots began their training in gliders. And therefore, when a 163 pilot took off and had burned that seven or eight minutes of uh, rocket fuel getting to altitude, Every takeoff meant it was going to be an unpowered landing, and therefore the early glider training that each pilot had was a definite benefit. Glogner safely belly lands the comet, having scored a rare fighter kill for the rocket interceptor. The comet went on to shoot down a total of 16 aircraft. Its main achievement was instilling a sense of fear of German technology in the minds of Allied pilots. They just did not know what else was out there. If, if, if they had the 262 jet, now they have this thing here, what else do we have to look forward to? What other nightmares are waiting for us? But despite all this, the ME-163 program proved a military failure. The problem was, it was not really a viable weapon, because so few were ever available at any time. They were complex and dangerous to operate. The ME-163 program has a unique distinction of having killed more pilots in training than they did in combat. Even Siegfried Schubert, the most successful Comet pilot, was not immune from the risk of flying the ME-163. Schubert continued flying uh, Comet missions until October, about two months after his record-setting uh, two-victory day. But that month, he was getting ready to launch in another Comet when apparently uh, the fuel exploded and he was killed in the detonation. Regardless of the danger, there was never a shortage of volunteers ready to take the rocket planes into battle. They were willing to sacrifice their lives, if necessary, to protect their home country. Sentiment echoed halfway across the world in the Empire of Japan. At the end of the war, the kamikaze terrorized the American Pacific Fleet. But a far more frightening application of the suicide pilot was in the works. A manned torpedo known simply as Kaiten, the Heaven Shaker. November 20th, 1944, 4 a.m. Most sailors aboard the USS Mississinewa are fast asleep. The fleet oiler sits in the midst of a massive American anchorage near the Pacific Atoll of Ulithi, the final staging area for the invasion of Japan. Ulithi anchorage uh, measures 21 miles wide by nine miles, a very, very large uh, area. At any one point in time, 200 US ships could be anchored in there. Matter of fact, US veterans often joke that they could walk all the way across the length of Ulithi and never touch the water. To the southwest, aboard the Japanese submarine I-47, Captain Senji Orita observes the massive American anchorage by periscope. 
Arita's attack plan was to move I-47 to southeast of Ulithi and make his attack to the northwest and into the central part of the Anchorage. Mounted on the top deck of I-47 are what look like modified torpedoes. These are the Kaiten, piloted suicide submarines intended to destroy ships anchored at Ulithi. For honor and the glory of Japan, Sub-Lieutenant Sakio Nashina, co-inventor of the Kaiten, leads the terrifying mission. At 4 a.m., Nashina and three other suicide pilots launch from the deck of I-47. The top secret plan quickly goes awry. Two Kai-10 run aground shortly after launch. Another is detected as a midget sub and sunk by U.S. destroyers. That leaves one Kai-10 piloted by Nishina. Nishina's target is an aircraft carrier, but aiming the torpedo proves difficult. Kai-10 pilots, uh, unlike kamikaze, could not see where they were going. They were sealed in their submersible and essentially blind. The only opportunity they had to see their target was to hand crank up a stubby periscope and take a bearing, try and sight your target, and take a final high-speed run in. An aircraft carrier is an unattainable target. But honor demands that an American ship be sunk. Nishina makes a fateful decision. He will attack the nearest American ship, the USS Mississinawa. The sailors cannot know the horror that lies in store for them at the hands of Imperial Japan's newest secret weapon, the Kaiten. By mid-1944, Japan's Pacific Empire was collapsing. Scarred by crushing defeats at Midway and the Marianas, Japanese military commanders turned to increasingly desperate measures. Including the toko, or suicide weapons. The hopeless logic that put pilots in the cockpits of kamikaze aircraft was soon applied to the infamous Type 93 Long Lance Torpedo, an idea pioneered by Sekio Nishina and Hiroshi Kuroki. By adding a small cockpit amidships and some rudimentary steering equipment, the torpedo was transformed into a guided missile. The pilot could steal in right under the nose of picket ships and PT boats that were not able to detect such a small craft. In the summer of 1944, the Imperial Navy sought volunteers to take the suicide subs into battle. The trainees in Kai-10 were referred to as pilots of this weapon, and they were largely drawn from the ranks of Imperial Japanese Navy aviators. Harumi Kawasaki was one such aviator. <laughs> I assume that it has something to do with aircraft. Upon graduation, we were put on a train, destination unknown. They wouldn't tell us where we were going. Later on board, we were told that we were going to Kure. In Kure, we were taken to a submarine base. Then, only then, I realized what the new weapon may be. The Kai-10 was 48 feet long, with a simple propeller engine driven by compressed air. And packed into the nose of the Kai-10 was the warhead. It was extraordinary, simply breathtaking. The Kaiten carries 1.6 tons of explosives. The bomber carries just a quarter of that. There's no other weapon that alone carries this much. 
Only we could single-handedly sink a battleship or an aircraft carrier. I was proud. August 24th, 1944. A massive B-17 bomber stream pierces the skies of Germany. The tide is turning against the Nazis. The Allies strike targets throughout the country with near impunity. Their main target was a complex in the Merseburg area, which involved an armament factory and some chemical plant. The Allied bombers are each packed with a heavy payload. B-51 Mustangs, the most advanced Allied fighter in Europe, provide top cover, ready to take on any fighters that rise to challenge the heavies. But 30,000 feet below, a lethal new threat is lying in wait. Luftwaffe pilot Siegfried Schubert prepares for the most dangerous mission of his life. He is one of the men of JG-400, tasked to fly an experimental interceptor into combat, the rocket-powered ME-163. From Schubert's perspective, he saw... ...ignites, creating a firestorm. swept through the forward berthing compartment through the open hatches and enveloped men who were instantly killed in their bunks. On the opposite end of the ship, 19-year-old seaman second class Herb Deitch gets a rude awakening. I was in my bunk and when the blast hit, I hit the floor. I was the second bunk up and then Actually, I just wanted to find out what the trouble was. Flames leap from the 73-foot hole in the hull. The choking smoke billows over a mile into the sky. Sailors uh, throughout Ulithia and surrounding vessels saw the ship was completely enveloped in smoke and flames and felt that not a single Mississippi sailor could possibly have survived. Herb Deitch makes it to the top deck and surveys the scene. All you saw was smoke, endless smoke. And it was getting cold because it was blocking out the sun. You looked around because you're bewildered. And then we saw a fire was ran along the sides of the ship. And after a while, even the railings got hot because the heat came up through the steel. The flames race aft. The sailors begin to abandon ship, diving into an ocean of fire as thousands of gallons of burning fuel oil leaks into the sea. I told them, don't put your life preservers on because the oil will, you know, the fire will burn you. You have to be below the water. In other words, you get down, you've got to go under the water, clear it, which they brought you in boot camp. Rescue boats from surrounding vessels brave the flames, oil, and smoke to drag fellow sailors to safety. In the end, 200 men are rescued. At 7 a.m., the Mississinewa lists heavily to port, capsizes, and sinks beneath the waves, carrying 63 sailors with her. The Heaven Shaker has left its murderous mark. The sinking of the Mississinewa would prove to be one of the only victories for the Kaiten. The program was a dismal failure. Only roughly half of the Kaiten pilots released from an I-class submarine ever even saw their target. Over 2,000 Japanese submariners on the mother submarines carrying Kaiten to combat were lost as well. The results were dismal at best with a weapon that had high hopes. Japan and Germany's development of unconventional secret weapons was a tactical failure. But 
But the existence of these shocking tools of destruction would drive the Allies to their own top-secret weapons program. One such secret initiative, codenamed Aphrodite, developed an ingenious weapon. A radio-controlled bomber packed with explosives, a precursor to the modern-day guided missile. But the effort will cost a prominent American his life. August 12, 1944, a U.S. Navy PB-4Y-1 Liberator, codenamed Suit Suit Black, takes off from Fairsfield Air Base in England. At the controls is 29-year-old Captain Joseph Kennedy, Jr., elder brother of future President John F. Kennedy. His co-pilot is weapons systems officer Wilford Willing. The two men are veterans of dozens of dangerous combat sorties, but today's is no ordinary mission. In July 23, 1944, the Navy set up what was called Project Anvil, which was the U.S. Uh, Navy's counterpart to the Army's Aphrodite. And what that entailed was uh, stripping down a PV-4Y1 Liberator from all of its components except those used to fly the drone with and pack it in with up to 20,000 pounds of uh, Torpix high explosive. The aircraft is also equipped with state-of-the-art radio and television technology. Suit Suit Black is a massive radio-controlled bomb tasked with destroying one of Nazi Germany's most feared secret weapons. In the summer of 1944, Germany unleashed some of its most secret projects, which were the V series of weapons. V being the German word for Jolpenschlag, or revenge type weapons. The first of the new revenge weapons to be unleashed is the V-1 buzz bomb, followed quickly by the V-2 ballistic missile. And now, Hitler prepares to complete his trilogy of terror with the V-3 supergun, a very long-range artillery piece capable of lobbing heavy shells from Mimoyek, France, all the way into the heart of London at the rate of two a minute. The V-3 was particularly fearful because it could launch up to 600 projectiles within the city and there's no telling how many thousands of people might have been injured and killed during such an attack. The Allies make a concerted effort to neutralize the V weapons sites dotted throughout the landscape of northern France, but the secret German bases are guarded intensely. These installations were so heavily reinforced with steel and concrete that conventional bombing was not harming them. Allied desperation reaches a fever pitch. An idea is proposed that would merge the latest technology with outdated war-weary aircraft, resulting in a rudimentary guided missile. In June of 1944, about two weeks after D-Day, the 8th Air Force in England got the approval to launch Project A, which stood for Aphrodite. And that was an innovative program to take war-weary B-17s, load them to the gunnels with as much as 11 tons of high explosive, and by remote control, using the brand new technology of television to guide them across the English Channel and dive them into precision targets, mainly V-1 sites. The Navy piggybacks onto Aphrodite with their own version of the program, codenamed Project Anvil. The only difference is the type of aircraft. The Navy flies the PB-4Y-1 Liberator. They'd begin stripping out components from the aircraft. The entire bombardier stage was stripped out, all the gun turret equipment was stripped out, all the hydraulic and electrical gear used to power the turrets were stripped out. And then it started being filled in with uh, Torpix high explosives. Approximately 400 boxes of the explosives were placed. The plane is rigged to fly by remote control. Two television cameras are fixed in the cockpit. One showed the instrument panel so that the drone controller in the other airplane 
could see the heading, the altitude, and uh, whether the wings were level, and also he could monitor the engine operation. But the second camera was mounted in the nose, looking straight ahead, so that when the drone operator had the target in sight, he saw exactly where the drone was heading. A pilot and co-pilot are needed to take the drone into the air and arm the weapons system. They then relinquish command to the radio control officer aboard an accompanying PV-1 Ventura that acts as a mothership. Once the drone was in level flight and it was confirmed that the drone operator did have positive control, at that point the armament officer would flip the switch and arm the high explosives aboard that airplane. Then he and the pilot would bail out over England. The radio control officer aboard the mothership monitors the drone's flight across the English Channel through the lo-fi TV monitor. Once over the target, the drone is sent into a steep dive, exploding on impact and causing an irreparable amount of damage. It is an incredibly risky mission, especially for the pilot and co-pilot of the flying bomb. This is a top secret mission that required the best of the best. And men such as Kennedy and Willie were such men. On August 12, 1944, Kennedy and Willie are part of a massive secret mission to take out the V-3 supergun bunker in Mimoyac, France. In the late afternoon of that day, they take their lumbering liberator into the sky on a date with destiny. August 12, 1944. Captain Joe Kennedy and co-pilot Wilford Willie lift their massive flying bomb off the runway of Bearsfield Air Base in England. Once smoothly in the air, the Liberator crew joins up with a dozen other planes in the strike package. A B-17 heads the charge, acting as navigator. Kennedy's suit suit black follows about a mile behind. Flanking the Liberator, Two P-38s carry the mission commanders. Two miles behind the drone, two PV-1 Venturas are the motherships, each carrying a radio control officer and the equipment necessary to steer the drone to target. Two twin-engine de Havilland Mosquitoes fly recon. One checks the weather, the other photographs the mission. Another B-17 flies in trail, acting as a signal relay to ensure good communication across the English Channel. A flight of P-51 Mustangs scan the skies from a perch position, ready to head off the threat of enemy fighters. Kennedy heads for the British coast, where he and Willie will bail out after handing control over to the motherships. Past Halsworth, Willie climbed out of the co-pilot's seat, started arming the aircraft, and turning the television on. Meanwhile, Kennedy was preparing to turn control of the aircraft over to the PV-1 mothership. Kennedy begins the handover procedure to the remote control of the mothership. The PV-1 mothership's pilot then started maneuvering the BQ drone to make sure all the systems were checked out, which they did. At that point, the mission was a go. The PB-4Y was responding properly to the drone ship's control inputs. So at that point, Kennedy would have been preparing to bail out, and Willie was anticipating in a matter of minutes of arming the explosives and the two men would bail out together. But suddenly, disaster strikes. The radio control officer sees a glitch on his TV scope. The signal cuts out. Less than one second later, the explosion hits. There was an initial detonation 
immediately followed by a massive secondary detonation when all 20,000 pounds of explosives went off. On the ground, trees were knocked down. Buildings up to 16 miles away were damaged. The concussion from the explosion knocked the entire formation all over the sky. The cause of the explosion remains unknown to this day. But most likely, a faulty circuit in the arming panel sparked one of the detonators on board. The first explosion triggered a chain reaction that made solving the mystery all but impossible. The crash area covered five square miles, and the largest piece of Kennedy's plane measured less than a foot in diameter. As a result of the dismal failure of the mission and the loss of Kennedy and Willie, Project Anvil is scrapped. Within weeks, the Allied Army's advance into Europe brought the existence of the program into question. The breakout from Normandy has already occurred, and that was in July, and eventually all of the uh, potential launch sites within range of southern England, especially London, were overrun by Anglo-American armies within a matter of weeks. As Allied ground troops overtook the V-3 supergun site at Mimoyek, it proved the futility of the tragic Anvil mission. The bombed-out site had been abandoned weeks earlier. There's a bittersweet aspect to Kennedy and Willie's sacrifice because the entire program essentially was too ambitious. It combined too many advanced technological concepts such as TV guidance and remote control to be successful in the limited time frame. But Project Anvil and its army counterpart would have a continuing legacy. Militarily, it was not a success. Experimentally, it was a success. This was the start of remote controlled guided weapons, the use of television cameras, the use of control devices. Those were the precursors to the weapon systems that you have now that are being used currently in warfare. Such was the case with most of the secret weapons of World War II. Their initial impact has been hugely overshadowed by their legacy of research, development, trial, and error. All of which paved the way for technologies of the future.